Isaiah chapter 65 is where we're going to be. Many of you know, you read online or you read articles or perhaps you have friends or family members who speak about deconstructing. It's a popular word. And without getting into the weeds of what that word does mean or should mean or all the varieties of meaning that is being injected into the word itself, it's generally used to describe not only the the questioning, the critical questioning from Christians of all that I have received, all of the truth claims and all of the practices to determine what is in fact true and not true, it is at a more nefarious level, if we're using the word the way that it's been traditionally used in philosophical circles, It is a deconstruction with the goal of freeing ourselves from any binding truth claims such that we would now be free to make our own reality and our own truth according to what we alone believe to be wise. That is in the various language games of postmodern philosophy, what deconstructionism is. Has meant. And so we have Christians today that consider themselves to be deconstructing. And that's not to say that there's nothing wrong with thinking critically about what you've received. There is much that we've received through the years that we need to separate from true doctrine put forward in God's word and inherited tradition that passes as true doctrine. Those two are not the same, and they deserve to be thought of well according to God's word. And so we have some professing Christians today that would put their deconstruction under the banner of semper reformanda, always reforming. The larger phrase, of course, is ecclesia reformata, semper reformanda. The church reformed, always reforming. And the idea behind that phrase is not that there was something wrong with the church's doctrine. The problem is the church not conforming itself to what it professes to believe. Semper reformanda means not I need to consider whether or not what I confess to be true is really true and change my doctrine. I need to evaluate my life in such a way that I would... Consider whether my life and what I believe and what our churches confess line up with how we live. And anywhere that we find our traditions and our lives out of concert with what we confess God's word to teach, it is not doctrine that changes, it is us. That's what's meant by the phrase. Semper Reformanda is not This idea that we are always reforming doctrine, always coming up with new doctrine, always adding new doctrines as we come into greater and greater knowledge of God's word. No, we confess the truth once for all, handed down to the saints, that apostolic gospel given to us in the word, and we don't budge from it, but we recognize that the doctrine of the church that we see in the Bible is often a long way off from our experience of the church in life, isn't it? Of this beautiful diadem, the most precious thing in God's hand in all of creation. And then we look back at our own experience and the churches around us and we consider all of her warts and all of her ugliness. And throughout the ages, she has been, that is the church, a very easy punching bag. And that's no different today. I see people write, I hear people speak, and I've had conversations with others that will say things like, you know, the problem with the church is, or the problem with the evangelical church is, and I would say, well, no, the problem with sweeping generalizations is, You have no real target at which you're taking aim. What do you mean when you say church? Do you mean your church that you grew up in? Do you mean the church that you're currently in? Do you mean 
an association of churches that cooperate together. Surely you can't mean every church that has always existed for all times and all places through the ages. That would require a kind of knowledge that you yourself don't possess. And so when you say the problem with the church is, what are you talking about? And when we come to realize that the scope of our knowledge is really much smaller than we in our pride would like to admit, it changes the way that we relate to the church. Even if we're in tough times, even when we've been wounded by the church, we avoid sweeping generalizations and we deal with particular issues, and that's exactly what Isaiah does. And it makes us stop. I think what we're going to see in our passage makes us stop for just a minute. I have no doubt that many of you at some point or another have had in your mind or have said out loud the problem with the church. Another scandal in the news. Another well-known Christian leader publicly disqualified due to sin. Of unloving congregations of Westboro Baptists and the type that we see splashed over the news. You see, the problem with the church is. I wonder how many of us, when we see those things, respond to chum in the water like the rest of the world and get a kind of feeding frenzy to go after the church? Or how many of us, when we go, oh, The present reality of who God has called us to be is not anywhere near that ideal to which God is making his people to become. And does it lead us to pray? Does it lead us to pray for the church? Not to be harsh with her or to dismiss her or to be critical toward her, but to pray for her. That is what Isaiah does. He looks at Israel and he goes, what's going on with your people? Why is the ideal, according to your words, so far off from the reality that I see? Have you forgotten us? Will you not act? Will you not speak? He is pleading on behalf of the church. Prove that your promises are true. Have you ever prayed that way for the church? Have you prayed that way for our church? What about when you've been wounded by another member in the church? Is that how you pray? Discontented, perhaps. It's really easy to think of all of the ways that our church or any church could be a whole lot better. But do you pray? God, help us grow in the grace and the knowledge of Christ. That we would not be as we are, but we would become who you would have us be. Do you ever pray that way? Isaiah instructs us that this really should probably be the first posture of many of us, not critical attitudes, but of a humble posture of recognizing that God can and will do in us what he said he would do, even if it seems to us from our human perspective, slow in coming about. Isaiah prays in Isaiah 64, and in Isaiah 65, our text today, God is going to answer. We're going to see three things in our passage. We're going to see God's true church. We're going to see God's passionate plea. And we're going to see God's future grace, the new creation. It's going to be a sweet time. And so keeping those things in mind, why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's word. Isaiah 65. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually, sacrificing in gardens and making offerings on bricks, who sit in tombs and spend the night in secret places, who eat pig's flesh and Broth of tainted meat is in their vessels. Who say, keep to yourself. Don't come near me. I'm too holy for you. There are a smoke in my nostrils. 
a fire that burns all the day. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silent, but I will repay. I will indeed repay into their lap both your iniquities and your father's iniquities together, says the Lord. Because they made offerings on the mountains and insulted me on the hills, I will measure into their lap payment for their former deeds. Thus says the Lord. As the new wine is found in the cluster, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is blessing in it, so I will do for my servant's sake, and do not destroy them all. I will bring forth offspring from Jacob and from Judah, possessors of my mountains. My chosen shall possess it, and my servants will dwell there. Sharon will become a pasture for the flocks in the valley of Achor, a place for herds to lie down. For my people have sought me. But you who forsake the Lord, who forget my holy mountain, who has set a table for fortune and fill cups of mixed wine for destiny, I will destine you to the sword and all of you will bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, you did not answer. And when I spoke, you did not listen. But you did what was evil in my eyes and you chose what I did not delight in. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, my servants shall eat, but you will be hungry. My servants shall drink, but you will be thirsty. My servants shall rejoice, but you will be put to shame. My servants will sing for gladness of heart, but you will cry out for pain of heart and wail for breaking of spirit. You shall leave your name to my chosen for a curse, and the Lord God will put you to death. But his servants he will call by another name, so that he who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth, and he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten and are hidden from my eyes. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. Oh, but be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and I will be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old and the sinner a hundred years old shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit and they will not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. And they will not labor in vain or bear children for calamity, for they will be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord and their descendants with them. For they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. Dust shall be the serpent's food, and they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. You can be seated. Isaiah prayed for revival in chapter 64. That's what we saw last time we were here. He says in verse 5, shall we be saved? Verse 12, God, will you keep silent? Isaiah 65 is God's answer to those prayers. You and I, as I noted in the introduction, might be tempted to look at the spiritual condition of the church, of moral disqualification of leaders and public scandals and the rejection of the authority of the Bible and the exclusivity and sufficiency of Christ. Oh, we might look at all of these and grow discouraged with the church. But God's answer is Far more abundantly, all that Isaiah knew to ask or think. Does God work that way? You bet he does. And it's been put here in Scripture for our good. So that we might learn from it and we might be thankful. Because from it, we're reminded that God is not indifferent to our suffering and our sin. 
He is a good father who knows us, who sees us, who hears us, and who acts to deliver us because we are truly his. But when we talk about that idea, those who are truly his, who is it then that belongs to the Lord? Like, who is it that really belongs to him? I think as we read this, that's the elephant in the room for Isaiah's audience. As Isaiah's preaching this message, that's the awkwardness that fills the room. Because he's saying that even though the nation of Israel had been chosen as God's special nation, out from Egypt, according to promises to Abraham, all under the old covenant, that not everyone in Israel was a true believer. In the Apostle Paul's words, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. So there's Israel, and then there's Israel. There's Israel, and then there's the church hidden within Israel, a faithful remnant. What is the difference then between the two? Isaiah is going to explain that there are some who seek God and many others who forsake him. And that is the line that is drawn. You may remember the Apostle Paul in his earthly ministry, who, if you remember, he himself was Jewish. He seemed to be jarred by this fact, that during his ministry, as he preached the gospel, he saw way more Gentiles coming to faith in Jesus than Jews. And so how do you make sense of that? The Jews have been given all of the covenants of promise. All of the promises of the gospel to find their yes and amen in Christ. They'd be given everything that they need to see what was coming and what had come in Christ. How are they completely whiffing on it? And how are all of these non-Jews who had been strangers to the covenant of promise, how are they coming to faith in Christ? How do we make sense of this? That was the problem that Paul wrote about in Romans 9 to 11. How do we make sense of who Israel really is when Israel is rejecting Christ? It was a theological problem that for Paul needed a scriptural answer. And where did Paul find the answer ultimately? He found it in Isaiah 65 verses 1 and 2. Some of you look in the margins, you'll notice a cross-reference that says Romans chapter 10. This is where Paul found the answer. It was proof to him that this is really what God had intended to happen all along. One plan, one gospel, one people. Let's not be confused by it. That the revelation of Christ and his church has made clear that which was perhaps not quite as clear in Isaiah's day. And so in verses 1 and 2, the rebellion of the Jews in Isaiah's day, that was those who were intent, in verse 2, on following their own devices, or quite literally their own thoughts, they are going to be cut off by God. And the Gentiles, those non-Jews, they are, according to verse 1, a nation who is not called by his name, and they are going to be grafted into God's gospel promises. So how do we make sense of this? Theocratic Israel, God's people under the old covenant, they're out. Non-Jews, the nations, they're in. That we see in the gospel that inness and outness is not exactly the way that, that Israel considered it to be. And maybe it won't always be that way for us as well. We need to understand inness and outness according to the truth of the gospel and not anything else. Otherwise, we get really confused. But we see here that Israel in Isaiah's day was rejected by God. Why? What happened? Why did did God ultimately reject Israel? Well, look at verse 2 again. It was because of their rebellious nature. They were a spiritually obstinate people. They wouldn't change. They wouldn't listen to God's word. They wouldn't turn from their sin. In fact, not so much a change between Isaiah's day and Jesus' day some 700 years later because Jesus parrots the truth of verses 1 and 2 in the parable of the tenants. You remember? Matthew 21, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, Israel, 
and be given to a people producing its fruits. Of course, what he's implying is that the kingdom of God and its fruits are being produced in a people that nobody expected it to be produced in. That is the nations. So rather than producing spiritual fruit, obstinate Israel produced rotten fruit. Stinky fruit. That's what Isaiah calls it all the way back in chapter 5. They produce stinky fruit. And you can see exactly what that, fr- that fruit looked like in verses 3 through 7. We see in verse 3 that they embraced a religion riddled with idolatry that included ritualistic orgies and sacred gardens. That it included worship from brick-built altars just like the Babylonians did. In verse 4, they practiced necromancy. That is the consulting of the dead in graveyards. And they disobeyed God's law under the old covenant by eating ceremonial and unclean foods against God's commands. All of that in verse 4 is to say, you look just like the nations. All of this, Isaiah says in verse 5, resulted in a puffed up, arrogant self-evaluation. You realize that every act of self-righteousness in their life and ours is a man-made attempt to cover up our own sinfulness. It's an attempt to hide sinfulness by some means other than Christ. And that's impossible. Because scan down to verse 11, Israel's self-righteousness blinded them to the fact that they were a worldly people, just like their pagan neighbors. They were worshiping the gods of luck and chance. Verse 11, of fortune And of destiny. You see, friends, God cannot condone sin. God is good to judge sinners. He cannot keep silent. Israel had provoked God to his face continually. See that in verse 3. And because of this, Isaiah says in verse 6, payback is coming. And in verse 7, it's coming in full. God's justice is never out of proportion to our crimes against him. Sometimes we read the descriptions of God's justice in the Bible against his enemies, and we think, what a terrifying and evil God Rather, we are meant to see in the holiness and the righteousness of God and of his response against sin, the utter wickedness of our rebellion. We get it backwards. We shouldn't look at the descriptions of God's justice and go, what's wrong with God? We should look at the descriptions of God's justice and go, oh, what in the world is wrong with us? That it would demand such a response from such a holy God. We think too little of God. And we think too highly of our sin or of ourselves. And because we think too highly of ourselves, we often think too little of our sin. And so we consequently think very little of the gospel and of God's grace, much less his justice. God, his justice is never out of proportion to our crimes against him. And so, brothers and sisters, we should be led at this point to examine ourselves, all of us. How do we do that? Let me give you three ways. First, we have to use God's law. Scholars have noted how the catalog of sins in verses 3 through 5 basically check off each of the Ten Commandments one by one, and that's the purpose of God's law. That is to reveal sin. When you and I compare ourselves to one another... When we compare ourselves to other people to determine whether or not we're doing okay or not, we tend to feel guilty for all kinds of things that we shouldn't feel guilty about. And we tend to not feel guilty for things that we should. Measuring ourselves against other sinful people is to measure ourselves against an imperfect and moving standard. We'll never hit the target. No, rather, God's law is what hones and calibrates our consciences. How is it that you who constantly feel guilty about things that you shouldn't feel guilty about find freedom? The answer is God's law. Let God define what is sin 
and not sin and feel bad about that. Anything that is right or wrong according to God's law, there should be conviction of sin when you violate it and you should feel guilty and run to Jesus. But anything that is right or left, that is not a clear command from God's law, well, unless there is some kind of sinful motivation beneath it, you don't need to feel guilty at all. I think one, in reality, one aspect of pastoral ministry is I spend time with you, and this is true in our own homes, is for you and I to stop demanding of one another things that God himself never demands of us. And to holding ourselves accountable to things that God himself never demands of us. And yet, at the same time, not holding one another and ourselves accountable to the very things that God does and will hold us accountable to. Are we holier than God that we would presume to create our own laws in the place of his? No, we let God's law calibrate our conscience and define our guilt. Secondly, as we are taught by God's law, we reject all self-righteousness. The law never intends to puff you up. If it does, you're using the law unlawfully. It never intends to puff you up. It is never intended to give you a sense of moral superiority over others as you, the obedient, and them, the disobedient. The Apostle Paul says that the law is a tutor that is meant to teach you about your hopelessness apart from a redeemer, and it is then to lead you to Christ. No person can come to the cross of Christ via the pathway created by God's law and leave more self-righteous than when they arrived. That's impossible. That's why Paul says if righteousness came by the law, then Christ died for no reason. To walk away from the cross, still scorning others and thinking more highly of yourself than others is to turn around for the cross and say, that thing is worthless, that I don't need it. All self-righteousness is a rejection of the cross of Christ and of the true doctrine therein of who we are and why Christ had to come. Thirdly, so we not only reject self-righteousness, but we grow in the assurance that we truly belong to Christ by exhibiting the opposite kind of fruit in our lives. Instead of rebelling against God, as we see Israel doing here, rebelling against his law, walking according to our own wisdom and our own ways, well, we submit to God's word because his word is good. In the power of Christ, we don't reject his law and live any way that we want. That's to abuse grace. Rather, we are strengthened by God's grace to obey his law, such that it becomes a delight to us. And even more than all of that, you may be assured that you do, in fact, belong to God and that you do not deserve the punishment of verses 6 and 7, not because of anything in yourself, because you deserve to have God pay it out on you in full, but that God laid the full punishment that you deserve on Christ in full at the cross, such that there is not one ounce of judgment remaining. Some of you, you got an old car wash sponge at home. You go outside and you wash your cars, or maybe you don't. Maybe you have your kids wash the cars, or you don't. You go to the car wash. But if you washed your cars, you'd have one of those big yellow sponges. And if you were to take that sponge and you were to pour water down on top of it, what you would find is the sponge soaking it up and none of it coming down underneath. It just soaks every ounce of it up. The illustration's limited because you can over-soak a sponge. But in a similar way, that is what it means for Christ to be our propitiation. Is all of God's wrath rightly deserved by us poured out on Christ such that not a single drop touches us? Brother and sister, your assurance that verses 6 and 7 will not fall on you, your assurance is Christ. Do you look to him before anything else? In fact, I would argue that you need to start there and then examine the fruit of your life. Don't just stick with fruit inspection, but you want to begin with the vine the source of your life. Am I in him? Well, 
We've seen God's true church in verses 1 through 7, but now in verses 8 to 16, we're going to see God's passionate plea. In verses 8 through 12, we see the outstretched arms of God pleading on behalf of Israel, as it were. It's an expression of God's genuine compassion. God says in verse 12, I called you over and over and over again, but you did not listen. But he says there are some, even if only a few, who did listen when I call. Notice in verse 8 that in Israel's disease-stricken vineyard, full of that stink fruit that Isaiah calls it, there is still some good in it. That hidden within all these rotten grapes are a few good ones. And to these handful of good grapes in the midst of this stinky vineyard, God promises peace, do not destroy it, and prosperity. There is blessing in it. And so Isaiah drives these gospel promises home in the following verses. Watch this. He's going to use local geography as an illustration. In verse 10, Sharon was a plain along the Mediterranean coast. It was just north of Joppa. It was known for its incredible foliage and its lush grazing land. Likewise, the Valley of Achor was on the western and the eastern edges of that land. And so you have A lush land where you can graze freely, guarded by valleys on either side such that no enemies can come. You have the high ground. That is what Isaiah is saying God will do for his faithful remnant. That he will grant them peace and security and he will give them prosperity. He will bless them. John Calvin saw this as a picture of the church in the days to come. He said this, that although in consequence of the banishment of her inhabitants into a distant country, that is, were scattered all over the world, sojourners and exiles, she shall be forsaken and desolate, yet she shall at length be inhabited. In other words, the way that we often see the church at present, is not the reality of who we are in Christ. Yet at length, he says, she shall be inhabited. That is this valley of Achor. Every one of God's elect is going to come and graze in this land. So as to abound in flocks and herds and have lands that are fertile and that are fit for pasture and supply abundantly everything that is necessary for the food and the support of men. That is God's vision for the church. And we see her in all of her tattered rags today in the way that we should see her is in the light of the vision of the valley of Achor and of the fields of Sharon. That is where God is leading us. To prosper us and to bless us and to secure us forever. And one day, our faith will be sight. Well, in verses 13 to 16, Isaiah then is going to underline, in light of this image, the contrast between the fate of the wicked, that is, the wicked among Israel, and the true remnant of God, the church hidden within the nation. The redeemed of the Lord, he says, can expect to eat and drink and rejoice and sing. You realize that's what we do now. It's what we're going to do for eternity, only in fullest measure. But the future of those who reject the Lord's mercy is the opposite. Scan through verses 13 to 16 again. They will be hungry, thirsty, put to shame, cry out for pain, and wail with a broken spirit. Israel had all of the covenants of promise and still they rejected him. They had all the outward accoutrements of public worship and still their heart was far from him. And that is a good warning for us today. That you may know a little bit of Bible. You might even be able to regurgitate the gospel. But do you believe it? And are you really in Christ? Going to church, having all the outward decor of a Christian does not mean you are a Christian. This is especially easy in a context where Christian nominalism is rewarded, like in the Bible Belt. 
What I mean by that is even though we might consider ourselves as living in a post-Christian age, and we do, and that Christian nominalism, that is those who are Christians in name only, is becoming less and less. All of those studies, it's interesting, all the studies that everybody does about why are so many people leaving the churches, especially millennials and, and so on and so forth, why are they leaving the churches? They have all kinds of sociological answers, but the one answer they never give is, but were they Christians? You and I should be warned. Just because we grew up in church and just because we went to a youth group or just because we say the right things and confess the right things does not mean that we have a heart that is captured by the grace of Christ. That has been made new by his grace and that loves him. And as long as we live, and we still do to some degree, though perhaps less than a few decades ago, live in a culture where you're rewarded for being a Christian in name at work among your neighbors in your family or whatever it may be, that it may be that your only reward will be found in this life. And so we should be warned. Just like Israel, we might have all of the covenants of promise and claim Christ and yet find ourselves on the outside looking in. That's why the apostles were so concerned with the church constantly evaluating themselves. Make sure that you are, in fact, in Christ. Help one another. That's the heart of discipleship. Well, what we see in verses 15 and 16 is the most damning sentence of all. To unbelievers, he declares in verse 15 that their name will become an expression of judgment, synonymous with it. At the end of history, your name will be synonymous with God's curses. When God's curses are pronounced, we'll think your name. When your name is mentioned, we'll think God's curses. They'll become so synonymous with one another. And yet, he says, to those who have faith in Christ, they have been given a different name. Verse 16, or into verse 15, he will call his servants by another name. Do you remember what that other name is? He already said what they were. All the way back in chapter 63 or rather 64. Or I'm missing it. This is what I get for preaching off the top of my head. All right, for the sake of time, we're not going to miss that. Go, don't go there. Anyways, you've been given a new name. If we were a true Baptist church, I would just call out and you would yell it back at me and then we would talk a little bit, but we're going to keep going. Well, according to Jesus... The difference between these two names and these two destinies are essentially that of the sheep and the goats. Matthew 25. Elsewhere, Jesus says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever does not obey the Son, that is, through the obedience of the gospel, shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And so true believers, verse 16, will be examples of God's blessing unbelievers will be examples of his judgment. True believers will be blessed by the God of truth in verse 16, and they will know God as true because he has kept his word to them. They will rejoice in the Lord because in verse 16, the former troubles are forgotten and they are hidden from his eyes. That language of forgotten and hidden gets picked up immediately because it's packed with theological freight. And it has everything to do with how God is going to answer Isaiah's prayer, which is exactly what he does in verses 17 to 25. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones once wrote, my whole outlook upon everything that happens to me should be governed by these three things. My realization of who I am, my consciousness of where I am going, and my knowledge of what awaits me when I get there. Who I am, where I'm going, what awaits me when I get there. He's saying the whole reality of my life has to be governed around these three realities. And that's exactly what Isaiah does here at the end of chapter 65. He's gonna show, he's, he shows us who we are. We are those who have been blessed by the God of truth. 
And now he turns his attention in verse 17 and following to where we are going and what awaits us when we get there. And Isaiah wants to encourage believers. And we've seen that from much of Isaiah's book, haven't we? That even though he's spoken hard and dark truths about sin and judgment, we see that Isaiah is above all an encourager. He wants to encourage God's saints to persevere, to return to God, to hope in Him, what they can't see as opposed to what they can. And in the midst of present difficulties, the prophet urges us now to look upwards. He wants us to think about what God is going to do. It's very similar to what Paul tells us to do in Colossians 3, that we would not set our eyes on the things below, but rather we would set our eyes on the things that are above, where Christ is. That's what Isaiah is going to do. He's going to, as it were, like a good pastor, put his hand under our chin and lift our eyes off of our present circumstances and of all of the weaknesses and the frailties and the warts of his people, and he's going to have us gaze at his ultimate goal, the goal for all of creation. He says, I want you to think about that. And when we do, I promise, he says, you're going to see your present in a different light. So let's follow along with Isaiah. At the beginning of the book, chapter one, Isaiah declared that Israel was a sinful nation, that they were nominal believers, believers in name only, but not in deed. And Isaiah poetically now explains how their hypocritical worship made God, in in chapter one, made God want to vomit. Time and again throughout the book, Isaiah outlines the particular nature of Israel's crimes against God, as we saw earlier in the chapter. They had broken their covenant with God, and they deserved all of its curses. That's why Isaiah explained in chapter 63 that God, quote, turned and became their enemy. We've seen how our Lord is a God of justice. He's a warrior, clothing himself for battle, preparing himself for war against his enemies. Only the elephant in the room is that all of unbelieving Israel is counted among them. They're not for him, then they're against him. And yet, as we saw just moments ago, there's a remnant a remnant in Israel who remained faithful, God's true Israel, the church. Hidden among unbelieving Israel as wheat among tares. And it's for these faithful few that Isaiah prayed in 64. When we continue to sin, we, you were angry. How can we be saved? After all of this, O oh Lord, will you hold yourself back? Will you keep silent forever? In a sense, the last half of Isaiah chapters 40 all the way to 66 is God's answer to that prayer. How can we be saved? Will you keep silent forever? And these handful of verses are the crescendo of that answer. That according to his promised covenant of grace, God will save his people and he will not abandon them. At the heart of this covenant is God's servant, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. His first coming initiated God's final act of redemption. His death on the cross in our place both covered our sin and his spirit now is shaping us into the holy people that God intends us to be. He is fitting us for heaven. All of the darkness of the previous pages now gives way to the glory of the new heavens and the new earth. And now Isaiah has taken us from the depths of sin to the heights of paradise. That's what he's trying to do. And so it would be an understatement to say, as is the case with all aspects, it seems, of eschatology, we'll get to that in a minute, that there's a problem of interpretation over the end of chapter 65. Faithful Christians don't necessarily agree on what it means. They disagree over how we should understand the last things in these verses. Much of the discussion revolves around how to understand the vision of verse 17, that vision of a new heavens and a new earth, in relationship to the verses that follow, most specifically, what seems to be the presence of death in verse 20. How do we reconcile those things? Before we dive in, let me just give you a little aside on eschatology. Logos eschaton, words about last things. Last things. 
all Christians, faithful Christians, should be in agreement that Christ is returning again, that he will judge the living and the dead, and he will make all things new. Amen? How that will happen, when it will happen, what kind of signs we should or should not be looking for as that day approaches, oh, those are things that we can argue about in love over good food and good drinks with the Bibles open, but we do not split over that. And we do not make our views of those things lines in the sand as tests of orthodoxy. True or false Christians. And so eschatology, words about the last things, are really important because the gospel doesn't end with the death and the resurrection of Christ. It ends and culminates in his return. So to talk about eschatology is to talk about the gospel, and we should care about it like that. And yet at the same time, we should be careful not to become overly scrupulous in our speculative interpretations. Some of you in here, some of the members in our church, you guys would call yourself a premillennialist. We have more time, we can go into all of that. Some of you would call yourself a postmillennialist or an amillennialist. Some of you would call yourself a panmillennialist. You would joke, you would say, ah, it's all gonna pan out in the end. Either way, we can't escape the reality that if the Bible teaches it, it's important. And we don't get to not think well about it just because it's hard. If the Bible teaches it, we want to labor and give ourselves to understanding it. And it is hard. This passage is difficult. I hope, by God's grace, I'm able to give a little bit of light, hopefully more light than heat, by the time we get to the end of it. Okay? There are some Christians that draw a hard line, faithful Christians, that draw a hard line between verse 17 and verses 18 to 25. They will contend that verse 17 is talking about a completed new creation, see the end of the Bible, but that all of the following verses, beginning in verse 18, refer to a future, literal, 1,000-year reign of Christ on earth before everything is made new. They are what we would call a pre-millennialist. The Christ reign is, his coming again is prior to a millennium. Other Christians likewise draw the same line between verse 17 and verses 18 to 25. Because they believe that verses 18 to 25 speak not of a future literal thousand year reign of Christ on earth, but of a new age that will come through Christian preaching and teaching. That as the gospel spreads and more and more people are converted, the world is going to become a little less evil, a little bit more peaceful and prosperous, a kind of Christian golden age in which the world is largely Christianized. And then Christ will return. These faithful brothers and sisters call themselves post-millennialists because in their view, Christ will return after a golden millennial age characterized by global Christianization through the proclamation of the gospel. These two views disagree with one another on really important points about eschatology, but they generally agree on how to interpret verse 20, and that is literally. That if you're going to interpret literally in verse 20, the presence of death, then you cannot be talking about the new creation hinted at in verse 17. It must be talking about something else. So they are in lockstep that verse 18 to 25 are in discontinuity with verse 17. Well, both of these views, in my estimation, seem to obscure the fact that just as verse 17 clearly speaks of a new heavens and a new earth, verse 18 calls upon the reader, that is, those who will inhabit this new heavens and new earth, to be glad and rejoice 
What's the word there? Forever. A thousand literal years is not forever. A spiritual millennial kingdom leading to a Christianized world is not forever. Likewise, verse 19 describes how weeping and crying will be heard no more. That is language that Revelation 21 applies to the final new creation. Not simply its inauguration, right? We're all new creations in Christ, but in its consummation after the coming of Christ. And so verses 18 through 25 then are simply describing the new creation of verse 17, and I think it is. Then what do we do with verse 20? Since death is mentioned in this verse, how can it refer to the final state? Isaiah has already said elsewhere that God's new creation will be marked by its deathlessness. Isaiah 25, he will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people. He will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. How then do we make sense of verse 20? Well, just as Isaiah has done time and again throughout his book, he is painting a poetic picture. And we are to interpret figurative language that is put forward in poetic form in light of other scriptures. So we go to Isaiah 25. He goes, okay, he's going to swallow up death forever. If that's true, then how do we understand Isaiah's use of the image of death in verse 20? It can't be actual death, can it? Well, not if it's talking about verse 17, the state of the new creation. Okay, then, well, then how is Isaiah using it? I want to argue that he's using figurative language that taps deeply into the human experience to describe how the inhabitants of the new earth are going to live incalculably, immeasurably long lives such that our own human experience with life and death cannot make sense of it. We can't wrap our minds around forever. And so Isaiah in verse 20 gives us cookies on the bottom shelf Language, figurative language, according to human experience that enables us to go, okay, I think I'm maybe getting it a little bit. That in the same way, remember in chapter 64, that the Lord's year of redemption is in speaking of a literal year. So the point of a hundred years old in verse 20 is not that it's a literal hundred years, but that in this new setting, lives are so incalculably long that a mere century which is an inexplicably long life in our own experience, isn't it? Otherwise, Willard Scott wouldn't have made a career off of putting him on Good Morning America or whatever it was, Today Show. Hey, look who turned 100. Whoa, 100? He's going, life in the new creation is going to be so incalculably long that a mere century that, that is inexplicably long in our own experience is shamefully brief. It will seem like a curse. All of this is poetic language for eternal life. He is using our own human experience of life and death to try to get us to understand that there will be no more death. What seems utterly ridiculous to us in our own human experience of life and death, what seems immeasurably ridiculous in this imagery is what's true in the new creation. And so we understand in verse 20, according to Isaiah's promise that he will swallow up death forever. We link that notion of forever into verse 18. They will rejoice forever. And then we take the wiping away of tears and the reproach of his people being taken away from all the earth. And I, we take all of that in light of verse 25, the peace that will come as language that is actually speaking of verse 17. So what then are we talking about? Let me summarize it for you. We could spend way more time here than is possible today. And by disagreeing with these faithful brothers and sisters that would have different interpretations, I'm in no way drawing lines in the sand. These aren't tests of orthodoxy. I'm just giving you as your pastor what I think is the most faithful interpretation in a really difficult passage in a limited amount of time that we have. We'll have to do an NPC Institute on eschatology sometime. I'm sure none of you will sign up. <laughs> 
Here, let me just summarize what we see in verses 17 to 25. In verse 17, a new heavens and a new earth is what we see. And it will be a new creation in which, according to verse 18, the faithful will be glad and rejoice forever because it will, in verse 19, mark the death of weeping and distress. In verse 25, the death of any kind of violence. And above all, in verse 20, the death of death itself. That is the new creation. In Isaiah 64, the prophet prayed for God to speak and act on behalf of his people. This is God's answer. One commentator helpfully observed, God often answers our prayers in a way that shames us for our unbelief. The Bible does not present an art of prayer. It presents the God of prayer. The God who calls before we answer and answers before we call. Far from prayer being man rising to God, it is man's response to what God has revealed. He concludes the basis of all prayer is what God has promised to do. This is, he says, the most valuable fruit of faith is praying according to God's promises. And so I don't want you to get caught up with end times ramblings. You're going to miss the big picture. What Isaiah wants us to see is, oh Lord, I look around and your church is not who you intend it to be. Will you keep silent? Will you refrain? Will you hold back? Or will you act? What will you do? God says, I will come and I will judge and I will separate the wheat from the tares and those who are faithful, those good grapes among all of the stinky grapes, I'm going to call them out and I'm going to bless them and secure them and I am going to prosper them. And I'm going to do it, he says, in a new creation where there is nothing defiled and they will have joy forever. Coram Deo. That is how God answers Isaiah's prayers. And so I would ask you again, when you consider all the weaknesses and the frailties and all of the warts of the church, whatever you mean by that, or perhaps more specifically of our church, you're here long enough, no doubt you will have your feelings hurt. You will have somebody offend you with their opinions Somebody will act insensitively because they don't have omniscience about everything going on in your life. We are not yet a perfected people. But by God's grace, we are a perfectible people. And so when you pray for our church and for other churches, even in the face of the bride's lingering ugliness, that old man that remains until the new creation. Do you pray like this? Do you pray knowing that there's going to come a day where pastoral counseling will never be needed again? That there is coming a day when there will be no more church discipline that there's coming a day that when church discipline in our own age does happen, we don't look at ourselves and go, oh, we fell woefully short. There's coming a day when all of our weaknesses and all of our failures and all of our sins and all of our frailties and all of the unraveling hymns of the bride's dress will be remembered no more. If there's coming a day when all of the failures of Christ's church will be remembered no more, who are we to fixate on them? Who are we to pedestal ourselves and to criticize? Perhaps we might make ourselves like Isaiah. God, will you save? Will you speak? Will you act? And we can do so in confidence 
Because he said, yes, I will. I am making a new creation. Do you believe that? I believe. And yet, God, help my unbelief. 